I'm going to read from Acts chapter 9, uh, verse 19b and 20. Paul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Preach the word. I can't begin to tell you how much that charge means. Because there'll be a day when you leave this place, and it won't sound like that when you get up to preach. You, you get up, and you take that for granted sometimes, and then you go to other places in the world, and it's not like that. In fact, most of the time when I get up to speak on Sunday morning, there's one person in the whole congregation that always says, preach the word. And it just so happens that it's my 14-year-old boy. All by himself, every Sunday morning, all by himself, he says, preach the word every time dad walks by to go to the pulpit. And it it means so much to me. When Paul, when I emailed Paul and I said, hey, what do you want me to talk about? And he he sends me back this, this topic, this heart for the gospel. I thought, man, throw me a fastball right down the middle, why don't you, Paul? A heart for the gospel. I think about our heart. And what that means, and and of course it always makes me think of sports, because I'm a sports guy, I'm an athlete. It makes me think of the movie The Replacements at halftime, when they ask him, what do we do to to turn the game around? And the coach taps on his chest, and he says, we need heart, we need heart. And of course he's talking about his quarterback that didn't play in the first half of the game. It just always turns my mind to even something that my dad would say when I was really young. I remember hearing about this guy who spent years at Tulsa as a wide receiver for Tulsa. And he was a good player, made All-American. But the truth is, there wasn't a lot of interest for him in the NFL. Now, we're talking about in the mid-70s. He comes out in 1976. He's in the draft. He gets taken by Bum Phillips and the Houston Oilers in the fourth round of the draft. And after four preseason games... They had no use for him. He's 5'10", he weighs 186 pounds, he doesn't run fast enough, he doesn't catch well enough, he doesn't seem to do anything really good. Yes, he was a good college player, but probably not going to make it in the NFL. The Houston Oilers are looking to cut him, and the Seattle Seahawks call him on the phone and say, we'll give you an eighth round draft pick for your rookie wideout that you just drafted. And they said, great, you can have him. <laughs> now, if you, don't, if you want to know what an eighth-round draft pick, the value of that is, the NFL doesn't have eight rounds in the draft anymore. They only have seven. Seattle offered nothing, basically, to get this wide out. He played for the Seahawks for 14 years. He ended up starting his rookie year due to some injuries and things. He played for the Seahawks for 14 years, and when he retired in 1990, he was a 10-time Pro Bowler, 10-time Pro Bowler. He led the National Football League for career receptions, yards, and touchdowns, and at the time he retired, Steve Largent was the greatest receiver who ever lived before Jerry Rice would become that later. And I said to my dad, I remember when I was very young, I have a card signed by Steve Largent. And I said, Dad, how was he so good? And he said, because you can't measure heart, son. Because you can measure six foot six, 350 pounds and a five flat 40, and you can measure a bench press and a vertical jump and a broad jump, and you can put all those things on a piece of paper, but you cannot measure heart son. Hmm. I like that. It stuck with me. I want to look at the hearts in Acts chapter 6 is where we'll begin. If you want to turn there, look at Acts chapter 6. In Acts 6, Stephen is going to get seized. Look at Acts 6 and verse 8. Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. And then some of those who belonged to the synagogue, synagogue of the freedmen and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and of those of Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. 
But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him and they seized him and they brought him before the council. Stephen's just telling people about Jesus. He's just telling people about God and they seize him and they put him and, and in front of the council, and rather than take this opportunity to defend himself, Stephen chooses another path. Stephen chooses another path. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen won't really defend himself at all. But what he will do is continue to preach. What he will do is continue to preach. He's going to say to these people, God was with Abraham, your forefathers, all the way back when and God was with Joseph and God was with Moses and God was it it's never been that God was not with you and your forefathers in fact he was always there God has never not been there he was even with Moses when Moses was rejected by his own people you remember Moses thought he was going to be the hero instead he ends up gone and God was with him then God was with Abraham when he told him to go. God was with Joseph when he was in Egypt. In fact, it was God who put Joseph in Egypt, preparing to save his people from the famine. God was with David. God has never dwelled in man-made houses. And that's Stephen's sermon in a nutshell. God has always been there. God has always been with your forefathers. But defend yourself, Stephen. Make a conclusion. I'm going to make a conclusion, all right? Look over at 7 and 51. Stephen says, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Here's my conclusion, and it has nothing to do with me, but everything to do with you. You're making the same mistake that they made for thousands of years. Get out your ears and start listening. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you've now betrayed and murdered. That's it. You specifically killed the righteous one. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not Keep it. There's your conclusion. You want a conclusion? You want to know why I'm not guilty? I'm not guilty because you killed Jesus. That's his speech. I see a man with a heart for the gospel. I see a man with a heart for the gospel. But the truth is, Stephen's not really who I want to focus on in this particular story. Because there's going to be another guy that shows up. See, when these people hear these things, they're enraged and they grind their teeth at him, verse 54. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Mm. They take Stephen. They lead him out of town. And I don't think they just asked him to walk out of town either. I think they probably grabbed hold of him. And made sure he got there. They get out of town. They dig a hole twice as deep as he is tall likely. And they flip him in it head over heels. Find the biggest rock that they can find. And throw it directly at his heart. And if. If by some chance he lives through it. They keep throwing stones in said hole until he doesn't live through it. And the guy that's standing by watching it all happen, a, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a guy with prominence of his own people, a guy that's financially backed to persecute Christians, is there approving of the whole thing. Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. Who is Saul of Tarsus? He's likely at this point a Jewish elite. He's grown up and taught at the feet of Gamaliel, who is, in fact, a Jewish elite. 
And here's this Saul who's going to be evil, frankly. Evil. They lay their garments at Saul's feet. Now flip over to chapter 8. Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. He dragged off men and women for what? Because he would knock on their door and say, who is Lord? And if the answer wasn't Caesar, that's all the reason he needed. That's all the reason he needed. To drag them out of their homes and have them put to death. Now that's some kind of persecution. That's some kind of a heart that I see in Saul. As he drags people out of their homes and ravages the church and spreads them out all over the world so that they're running for their lives and these people keep preaching the gospel. Now those who were scattered about went about preaching the word. And so what did Paul do? Was his persecution not enough? Clearly it wasn't. Turn over to Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. It wasn't enough for Paul just to persecute people there where he was. After they scattered and ran away, he needed to get orders to go get them. I'll go get them wherever they're at. I'll persecute the church anywhere I can find the church. And I'll drag them out and I'll have them chained and I'll have them put to death. Now let's measure the heart of Saul. Let's measure the heart of Saul. Can we measure the heart of Saul? It doesn't seem difficult to me. The guy seems cuddly as a cactus, doesn't he? I mean, my goodness, he's a great guy. I'll tell you what he is. His heart is an empty hole. That's what it is. A dead tomato splotched with moldy purple spots. His soul is an appalling dump heap overflowing with the most disgraceful assortment of deplorable rubbish imaginable mangled up and tangled up in knots. Have I gotten it about right? Your heart is full of unwashed socks, Paul, and your soul is full of gunk. And the three words that best describe you, and I quote, are stink, stank, stunk. Did I get it? Did I get it? Did we find the heart of Paul? Did we find the heart of Paul? Hmm. I don't know. Look at Acts 9, 3. As he went on his way. He approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you'll be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight. He neither ate nor drank. There was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision. A man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered and said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who are calling on your name. See, Ananias sees Paul's heart the same way that I see Paul's heart. And he says, I'm not going there. You got to be crazy, Lord. But God says, go. For he's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings of the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And so Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, 
He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. And then he rose, and he was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is the Son of God. You see, while you and I were measuring the heart of Paul to be two sizes too small, God was measuring the heart of Paul to be a man who would impact the kingdom more than maybe any other man that's ever lived aside from Jesus. While you and I can't measure the heart of Paul, maybe God can. In fact, maybe God can only measure it, but God can make it grow. And God can make it change. And God saw a heart of Paul that you and I did not see. God saw a heart that would become all things to all men so that he might save some. 1 Corinthians 9.22 God saw a heart that didn't try to measure the hearts of other men, but tried to show them the grace and mercy that God showed him. God saw a heart that would share the desire of God that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. God saw in Saul of Tarsus a heart that would not let him stop sharing the gospel of Jesus. While you and I were looking at Saul seeing an evil man with a heart that was too small, God was looking at Saul and seeing a man that had a heart for the gospel. Wow. Wow. God saw a man who would tell the whole world that Jesus was alive. God saw a man who would tell the whole world over and over, everywhere he went, that Jesus died, that he was buried, and he got up and walked out of that grave. What does God see in you? Now look in the mirror. What does God see in you? Does God see in you a man that's going to get up and go tell people in Alaska that Jesus is alive? Will you tell people in California that Jesus is alive? Will you tell people in Oklahoma that Jesus is alive? What about right here in Texas? Will you tell people in Lubbock that Jesus is alive? Will you tell them in Mexico? Will you tell them in Thailand? Will you tell them in the Ukraine? Will you tell them in China? Where will you tell people that Jesus is alive? Do you have a heart for the gospel? Will you not stop talking about Jesus? Because the tomb's still empty. The tomb is still empty. Hmm. Some of you guys are looking at me like, does this guy really think we can change the world? Does he really think we can change the world? Do you really believe that the world is that changeable? The truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter if you believe you can change the world. What matters is that you have a heart that will allow God to change the world. Hmm. I pray that you do. I pray that you do. And I pray that God blesses you in every step that you take to tell people that Jesus is alive. God bless you.